Welcome, welcome to our friends, old and new. I am Mary Novak and I serve as Executive Director of Network Lobby and Network Advocates for Catholic Social Justice. This afternoon or this morning, depending on where you are joining us from, we have the fourth installment of our series, White Supremacy in American Christianity. We aired the first one right before Holy Week in 2022. Part two, we aired in October 22, and part three in October 23. Over 10,000 people have viewed the first three programs in this series. And today's program has over 1,750 registrations, which includes single registrations for groups who are gathering all over the country to watch together today. And we have 34 incredible sponsors. You saw them in the, the second slide. Joan, Robbie, Brian, there is a hunger for what you are bringing us and what you are bringing us today in particular. Thank you for leading us in this two year journey. After the first three sessions that laid out really how white supremacy and American Christianity are integrally related, it is fitting that on the Saturday after Easter in the Western church, we are engaging in white supremacy in American Christianity and moving toward beloved community. To pray us into our time today, we are graced to have our friend, Reverend Dr. Leslie Copeland Toon lead us. Reverend Copeland Toon is the Chief Operating Officer of the National Council of Churches. And because Leslie could not be with us in person today, she has provided us with this beautiful video. Things. I greet you with the love of God in the season of resurrection hope. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. I am honored to join you to open this important event on white supremacy white supremacy and American Christianity, moving toward beloved community that Network is hosting. I always feel blessed to work with Mary and Laura, Joan, Meg, Emily, and the rest of the dedicated staff at Network. And I'm thrilled that you are having this critical conversation about white supremacy and American Christianity at this precarious moment in our nation's history. It is impossible to address a problem that we do not understand or are unwilling to recognize. It takes conversations like this one and intentionality, resilience, and persistence to face an issue so deeply interwoven into the psyche and fabric of American society, and sadly, into our faith tra traditions as Christians in America. White supremacy is a cancer that has metastasized in American culture. As far as we can tell, it started with the annihilation of indigenous people, grew with the enslavement and dehumanization of African peoples, spread through segregation and Jim Crow, and has permeated its way through American institutions, including the church. Churches bought and sold enslaved people. Religious institutions did the same. Church people made lynching a celebrated part of Sunday worship services all because they embraced the lie that whiteness was supreme and black and brown people were less than, not just in their eyes, but in the eyes of God. Lord have mercy on us. Rather than uplifting and fighting for the dignity of all of God's creation, too often it was Christian churches, it was us, that maintained the status quo of inhumanity and mistreatment, degradation and hatred. If we are to move from white supremacy and towards being the beloved community, we must acknowledge this sinfulness, repent of it, and turn in a different and more just direction. Yes, we must be woke enough to work to uproot white supremacy at its core and not just treat the symptoms. I'm reminded of Jesus's words of warning in Matthew, the seventh chapter, verse 15. 
It says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Indeed, white supremacy is a ravenous wolf that uses a bullhorn of hatred and discontent, divisiveness and vitriol to keep us at odds with one another. There are ravenous wolves in sheep's clothing using code words like wokeness and DEI or diversity, equity and inclusion, critical race theory and even the border crisis to keep us at odds with one another and never truly reconcile our past, present and the future that God has for us. A future where God's kingdom is on earth as it is in heaven. There are ravenous wolves in sheep's clothing who tell lies that racial inequity is the fault of Black people and other minority groups because of their limitations. Lies that tell us women are also less than and should be treated accordingly. Lies that the color of our skin determines our value rather than the creator and sustainer of the universe, declaring that all of God's creation is good. But this gathering defies the lies. It is a bold and courageous step towards pulling back the wool that has been put over our eyes and moving us in the direction of embracing and establishing the beloved community. I am grateful for the work that you will do in moving us towards this goal. Now let us join our hearts and minds and pray together. God of grace and of mercy, you who first loved us, we come before you this day asking for your presence and your wisdom as we gather. We pray that you would open our hearts and our minds and our ears that we might hear your voice through the panelists and the questions and the conversation. Help us to know how we can make a difference in moving our families, our neighbors, our nation towards being a beloved community where the dignity of each person is valued where we recognize that we are all created in the image of God, where we live out our call to love others as we love ourselves, and even more importantly, to love one another as you love us, creating us the determination to end white supremacy and to root it out of our churches, our society, and even out of our own hearts. Help us to recognize it when we see it, even when it seems to benefit us, in our lives. Help us, O oh God, to connect the dots of our troubled and violent past, our present realities of inequity and injustice, and our uncertain, filter, uh, our uncertain future filled with promise and possibilities, but with wickedness and unrighteousness hovering to take us down a dangerous and dismal road. Lord, help us to be the leaders, the advocates, the light, the beacons of hope you have called us to be in a moment when racist and misogynist wolves dressed up in righteous sheep's clothing threaten to erase or bury our history deep into the social justice dementia of the American psyche. Lord, help us to not fall prey to those whose own selfish ambition and vain imaginations have led them down a path of destruction where they peddle your word for their own gain rather than live and be who you have called us to be as ministers of reconciliation and ambassadors for Christ. Let this time of gathering help us to change this detrimental trajectory. Let our time together change us and transform us so that we may leave ready to move boldly and courageously towards a beloved community. Let us leave this time of sharing ever the more committed to root out white supremacy and to establish the beloved community in all of the places and spaces where we have influence. Bless these speakers now, O oh God, and the moderators and all who will participate. Give them wisdom beyond this moment, we pray. Fortify us, O oh God, for the work ahead. May we embrace this assignment and this charge as we go forward. In the name of the one who came that we may have an abundant life, may it be so. Amen, amen, and amen. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Leslie. Now let me turn you over to Joan Neal, who since July 2021 has served as Network's beloved 
Deputy Executive Director and Chief Equity Officer. This series is Joan's brainchild. And we are all so much better for this journey we've been on together. Thank you, Joan. Over to you. Thank you, Mary. And good afternoon to all who have joined us today for this uh, challenging and stimulating conversation. White Supremacy and American Christianity 4, Moving Toward the Beloved Community. We are so fortunate to have again with us this afternoon, Dr. Robert P. Jones and Father Brian Massengale, who are both outspoken prophetic voices, diagnosing our climate today and pointing us toward a better tomorrow. <coughs> also joining us today is my colleague, Colin Martinez Longmore, communications and social media coordinator who will moderate a panel of young adults about civic engagement and the upcoming election. We will also be able to take a few questions from the audience and we will close out with a call to action. Feel free to submit your questions by text <coughs> to 202-601-7871 or by email to info at networklobby.org um, all throughout the program. And now it is my pleasure to begin our conversation by introducing our first two panelists. Dr. Robert P. Jones is president and founder of Public Religion Research Institute, PRRI, a nonprofit, nonpartisan research organization that looks at the nexus between religion, culture, and politics. He is also the author of the recent New York Times bestseller, the Hidden Roots of White Supremacy and the Path to a Shared American Future, as well as White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity and The End of White Christian America. Dr. Jones writes and speaks regularly on politics, culture, and religion for many online and major media outlets. To hear more from Dr. Jones, we encourage you to visit his website, at www.white2long.net and subscribe to his free weekly newsletter entitled White Too Long. Joining Dr. Jones again is Father Brian Massengale, who is the James and Nancy Buckman Professor of Theological and Social Ethics at Fordham University, as well as their Senior Ethics Fellow in the Center for Ethics Education. Prior to his appointment at Fordham, he was a professor of theology at Marquette University. In addition to his academic pursuits, Father Massengale strives to be a scholar activist through serving faith-based groups, advancing justice in society. He is the author of Racial Justice and the Catholic Church, as well as numerous articles, publications, presentations, and award-winning commentaries on racism and other social issues from a faith perspective. He is quoted generously in this week's National Catholic Reporter article on racism and the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. You can find that article at www.ncronline.org slash news. So welcome, Robbie and Brian. Here we are again for our fourth conversation Thank you for your willingness to continue to be in dialogue with us during this unprecedented time in our country. We have had great conversations uncovering the roots of the intertwining of white supremacy and American Christianity. We named the danger that this phenomenon is to our country, and we acknowledge the likelihood of this phenomenon outlasting the people who are championing, championing it today. And now we want to turn to our future and how we move from where we are to the beloved community, a multiracial, multi-faith, inclusive democracy where everyone can enjoy the freedoms and agency that only a democracy can provide. So let's dig right in. So here's my first question for you too. We are approximately eight months out from our next federal and local elections. How do each of you size up where we are at this point in our country 
and in our Christian churches and communities. Brian, maybe you could start us off. Uh, in the wake of, the, of our observation, uh, observance of Holy Week in our Christian calendar and the miracle of Easter, what is the state of Christianity, especially in the Catholic Church, which you know so well, and its relationship to the gospel of Jesus Christ? And then Brian, uh, uh, sorry, Robin, <laughs> please tell us what your research shows about where American Christians are in general across the spectrum of Christian faith communities with respect to our country and its democratic values. Brian. Start us out, please. Okay. Well, thank you, Joan. And it's good to be with you and Robbie again for this very important conversation. And I thank Network for and many other sponsors for their support in bringing this message to the people of faith who are really, really hungry for intelligent, informed conversation about these issues. Um, where are we? Um, there are several words I could use. Um, I say some of us are, I think the faith community, the Catholic Church is finding itself polarized on these issues. I think all too often the political polarization we find in wider society finds itself expressed in the Catholic Church as well. Um, I find a disturbing level of apathy um, among all too many um, who basically are looking at this election season at least eight months out as you know, kind of being more of the same, that this is just another um, election where there's really nothing different from what's gone before. I think in general, people are unaware of the deep stakes that are present in this election season, that we're not just choosing between two political parties, but we're really choosing the future of our nation and the future of our church. And that brings me to the phrase I would use to describe where we are as a church and a state of American Christianity. And that is we're at a fork in the road. Mm. And we often use the term inflection point. I don't like using that because it sounds too academic. I think we're really at a fork in the road mm. and that the, the church the Catholic Church, Christianity, and the country have to make a decision about what direction are we moving in. One fork leads to liberty and justice only for some. For those who basically are white, male, conservative Christians. Do we want to create a country where only that voice, that position is seen as authentically American and truly worthy of respect? Or will we move down the road of building a multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy, which as imperfect as it is, is still a democracy that tries to recognize the dignity, worth, and value of all people, Christian and non-Christian? black and white and brown and yellow? Are we willing to, to build a country that recognizes the dignity of people of every gender and all sexu sexualities? That's the kind of work in the road that we're at and that's what's really at stake. And what I fear is that few in our country and few in our church really understand the gravity of the moment and the, really the kind of decision that faces us, that both church and society are at a decisive fork in the road. How, what kind of country will we build, but also what kind of Christianity do we espouse? Yeah. I think that's the thing that I think not a lot of church people see, and that is what kind of Christianity do we espouse? Um, I think that in light of re events that happened during Holy Week, when Christians were celebrating Holy Week, we had a major political figure hawking the Bible. I mean, I just have to put it that bluntly, hawking the Bible, selling it for $60, a book that's available free of charge, and then identifying only one particular brand of politics as being the authentic expression of Christianity. 
And I think that moment crystallizes the work in the role that we are at as a country and as a Christian, as a, as, as a Christian faith in this country. One road leads down to liberty and justice, but only for some. And the other tries to build this multiracial, multi-ethnic community that is that prizes all, defends the rights of all, and recognizes all as being children of God. So that's where we're at right now. We're at a decisive fork in the road. Yeah. And that's the gravity of the moment that we're in. I like that uh, characterization, um, especially as it pertains to those of us who proclaim to be Christian. And so, Robbie, what... What do you learn or what have you learned from your research around this? Well, thank you so much. I'm, I'm so honored to be here today for this very, very important conversation. I, I completely agree with, with Brian. I mean, the stakes could not be higher. Um, I, and I think it's hard to, sometimes it's hard for me to grasp, I think, just how high the stakes are. It's, I think it's sometimes hard to kind of communicate that out. But I can honestly say that, um, uh, so I was born in 1968. Um, there has certainly been no election in my li my lifetime uh, that I would say where there is more at stake uh, than this one uh, before us. And I say that not because uh, it, it's not really a partisan uh, thing. That I, the reason I say that, because, you know, I prefer a Democrat to win rather than a Republican or the other way around. It's not really about that at all. Um, the, the problem and the challenge that we're facing is that we do have um, a figure who has taken over one of our two political parties and who is leaning it in a fascist white Christian nationalist direction, right? And that's what's at stake uh, in, in front of us today. And I want to say a little bit of word about white supremacy because, um, you know, one, it's, it's, I think, really important that we're using that word and that we're not talking around it um, and, and that we're putting it out there and making that the center and that we're juxtaposing it against the beloved community, because mm -hmm. I, I think that that is right, that this is these are the things, the thing that's always in the American context, the thing that's been one of the strongest uh, things in the way of um, you know, what Dr. King and others talked about uh, as the beloved community has always been white supremacy. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, King was, uh, uh, you know, often said, you know, and is true still largely today that 11 a.m. on Sunday morning. Right. Is. Uh, uh, the most segregated hour uh, in, in America. Mm -hmm. I, and we're still struggling uh, I, with that. But just a, a quick word about white supremacy. It, it's something sort of, I as someone who, I, I grew up, as many of you know, in the South as a Southern Baptist on the Protestant side of the faith. Um, uh, and, you know, was kind of that Southern Baptist tradition um, was like shot through uh, with white supremacy. I mean, our denomination was literally founded uh, to make enslaving other people based on the color of their skin compatible with the gospel. Like that's what the Southern and Southern Baptist means. Um, and I think that the thing that many people who look like me or have European descent, even, even I think um, uh, thoughtful uh, people, when they, when they hear the word white supremacy, what happens too often to us is that we tend to think of it as something very distant uh, from us. So we think of it as a black and white photo of the KKK burning across in the 1920s yeah. uh, or even further back. We think of the Civil War and, and slavery, um, uh, but it doesn't come very close to home uh, uh, for us. Uh, you know, and are we thinking maybe maybe we get to segregate, maybe get to the 20th century and segregation. Uh, but that's as far as, as as close as it gets to us. It still sits half a century uh, you know, back from us. And But I, I think the thing that we're still really struggling with is just how much of that has is has a grip um, on our country and our faith, uh, and that we really have to kind of be open-eyed about that. And, and I I think one of the the, the gifts that uh, these last few years have given us um, the, with the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement and this era of reckoning that we're in is that we're actually more conscious of the choices that are in front of us, mm -hmm. right? In ways that I think for many, at least many white people, buried. Uh, the obvious uh, right in front of us. But I think there's really uh, no one here who I can't can't see uh, the things that are right in front of us today. Um, and, and, and so when I think about white supremacy, you know, it's not sort of the KKK and people in robes, but it is the very idea, right, that this country was intended to be a promised land for European Christians. Like that is the oldest form of that in this country. Uh, uh, that claim, right, it's what explains the um, uh, the genocide and displacement of indigenous people here in this country. 
It's what explains the entire colonial settler project. It's what explains the enslavement of Africans and the transatlantic slave trade. And it's important for us to remember, I think, people of faith, that if at any time a majority of European Christians would have said no to any of that, we could have ended it immediately. Right. And the reason why this has been with us and we are still dealing with the legacy of all of that is because we continually said yes uh, to those things. So manifest destiny, this idea of providence and the city set on the hill, and that's who the country is, has always been justified by a Christian theology based on white supremacy. Mm -hmm. So we have to kind of remember that. I mean, the things that justified all of it was the superiority of European civilization and the superiority of Christianity that justified the domination and the violence. Uh, and so like, I think being very clear about that, and I think that you're right, Brian. I think the the fork in the road that is facing us is exactly you know uh, what you said. And I, I again, it's not a matter of which party is going to win a, an election. It is a choice about who we're going to be as a country and who we're going to be as Christians, uh, you know, going forward um, for this you know this audience in particular. Uh, and it is that that question, you know, are are we going to double down and say? Uh, actually, this country is, that's what we think of this country as a promised land for European Christians and everybody else is second tier uh, or third tier citizens are not, are, are deported uh, from our borders. Um, or are we a pluralistic uh, democracy, right? Uh, that, that, uh, and there's a Christian vision there to support, uh, to support that of inclusion, right? And equality and all of those values. And, and I think that's really what's at stake. And there's, this is one of those elections where I think, um, uh, the, you know, in legislative session, uh, you know, if any of you remember your Robert's Rules of Order, um, you know, when you want to end debate uh, and you have to do something, uh, somebody calls the question is what it's called, right? You call for the question. Uh, and I think this time has called the question uh, for us. And when you call the question, the debates end and you have to raise your hand and put yourself on one side of the issue um, or the other. Um, and I, I think that's really where we are uh, at this moment. It's exactly what's at stake. I want to take just one minute to unpack a little bit about what happened, Brian, because I think um, so much goes by, I think, uh, happened during Holy Week. I mean, so much goes by so fast. I think we don't quite grasp uh, the layers um, of it here. And I just want to give like one. So there was, um, you mentioned the Bible, right? The, the, this, and, and I, I, you know, I hesitate to call it a Bible. It, it contains uh, the Old and New Testaments, uh, you know, in it, but wrapped in it, it's got also the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights, and of all things, uh, Lee Greenwood's, uh, the lyrics to Lee Greenwood's uh, uh, a song, God Bless the USA, right? So it's got all kinds of weird things all wrapped up in one, calling it um, a, a Bible. But what's, what's notable about that is that that kind of amalgamation of things was actually created uh, by a group of white evangelicals in opposition to the Black Lives Matter movement. So that's the history. My good friend Jamar Tisby has really unpacked this history and really traced it down. Um, uh, and he's a historian. And it is quite remarkable that white supremacy is not far from that, that Bible that's being hawked, right? Um, that The creation of that was as a pushback uh, by white evangelical Christians to the Black Lives Matter movement and reclaiming a vision of white Christian America. That's what that is about. Um, and then the other one I want to mention as well is there was a, a Bible verse that was trotting around social media comparing uh, the former president um, who's talking the Bible um, to Jesus during Holy Week, right? Yeah. On Holy Tuesday. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so this, actually, that was Holy Monday. Holy Tuesday is when the Bible started getting hawked. Holy Monday um, is, is when that happens. And again, if you slow it down, you think, OK, well, in the face of that, that's absurd. Right. Um, uh, and, and but. If you slow it down more, the, the supporter that was uh, kind of saying, hey, isn't it ironic that they're trying to take your properties from you on the same week that they were trying to take Jesus's life, uh, right? And kind of making that comparison. Trump re uh, uh, retreats it and calls it beautiful, uh, the sentiment. Uh, but attached to it was Psalm 109, uh, right? Now, that may not immediately register to anyone as anything significant, but that verse um, has become a right-wing racist meme. Uh, that is traveling around the internet. It was created during the Tea Party against Barack Obama. And if you kind of slow it down and you look at it, um, what you end up seeing 
um, is that behind all of that uh, is this uh, this verse, and it ends. The reason why they're using it uh, is because it um, it it ends by um, saying, "Let his days be few, and let another take his office." Right. So it's aimed at. It began being aimed at Obama. Uh, it was aimed at Biden. But if you read the rest of the the, the next following verses, it is a racist call to violence against a sitting president. The next verses are, "Let his children be fatherless, and his wife a widow." Let his children continually be vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread also from their desolate places. And this is being uh, trotted out and being called beautiful uh, by one of our two uh, presidential candidates against uh, another presidential candidate. And again, it has this racist history because it was kind of it was essentially a death wish for Obama using Christian scripture and the Hebrew Bible um, uh, to do it. And so I think if we kind of see the layers of these things, white supremacy is just barely under the surface um, uh, of so many of the things that we're experiencing. And I do think, is, you know, if we're talking with the beloved community, uh, you know, one, the first thing we've got to do is to name that threat, call it out, right, and shut the door uh, to it. Like, and, and we really have to be able to speak out with one voice against these kinds of things um, uh, if we're ever going to get anywhere near uh, moving toward uh, the beloved community. But I agree with you. Uh, we, we are at a fork in a road. Um, and the stakes have never been higher. I need to uh, follow up on that, Robbie. That is yeah. amazing. But, well, because, but it also points out that behind this belief that America was meant to be this promised land for European Christians, there has always been the threat of violence to enforce yeah. that belief. And I think we have to understand that part of what makes this moment so fraught for us right now and so decisive for us right now is that we're seeing that the, the, the use of violence, the appeal to violence, isn't simply rhetorical or um, intellectual or abstract. No, we're seeing violent threats and intimidation being used in overt ways, in ways that few of us can remember, um, that violence is just under the surface and barely under the surface in the name of an anti-democratic pro pseudo christian idea that this is supposed to be a promised land for conservative christians and that needs to be enforced not only by the church but also by the threat of violence and so we're seeing violence directed against um poll workers for example yeah. We're seeing violence directed against um, court officials and judges and their families. Um, that this is not, uh, we're not talking about something that's abstract. We're not talking about something that's in the past. We associate, like you said before, white supremacy with the, the threats of violent acts of KKK people. Violent intimidation is what's going on now. January 6th was the most obvious manifestation but it's not the only manifestation. We're, li we're living in a time when political violence and violent rhetoric has been normalized and normalized in the name of a pseudo-Christian ideology. And that is why both church and society are at a decisive cross, a fork in the road here. And you're absolutely right in trying and still in slowing us down and taking us Look at what's happening here and look at what is being offered as normal, acceptable in the name of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And this is what makes that um, the Bible, that Bible so insidious that by putting the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence along equal side, the word of God. You don't have the word of God standing in judgment of the United States, which is what it's supposed to be, because no nation is supposed to be on equal par with the word of God. But what you're basically saying is that if you don't accept our interpretation of the Constitution, our understanding of the Constitution, then you're not being an authentic Christian. And you're making the Constitution and one, one man's political ideology the litmus test of authentic Christianity. And there's only one word for that, and that's idolatry. Okay. And yeah. that's the reason why this election is so crucial for both the country mm -hmm. and for the churches. 
And I wish more of our religious leaders would grasp the, the gravity of the challenge that's before us. What pains me as a Catholic is that so few of my bishops, so few of my fellow priests really see the gravity of the moment that we're in, not just for our survival as a nation, but for our integrity and our authenticity as followers of Jesus Christ. Yeah. I was saying, can I add one, one quick thing uh, just on that? I know we're gonna get to another question, but I, I, I find it so important. Um, one thing that I think is notable about this that is actually different, because I think uh, one of the problems with kind of seeing the what's at stake is that this all feels like a movie we've seen before, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we, we've seen this movie twice, uh, you know, uh, already. Uh, but I want to say, like, in fact, no, it's actually different this time, right? This is not just a sequel. Um, the, the rhetoric has shifted, uh, even in more extreme fashions where you're exactly right, violence is doing and one of the ways that's been doing that we should all kind of tune our ears to is the dehumanization of political opponents, right? And dehumanization of immigrants, dehumanization of anyone on the other side. And so we are hearing words, you know, that again, I mean, the last time I heard words like this from a public official or read them was a, literally um, from Nazi Germany, right? When you hear words like vermin, yes. uh, people being called yes. vermin and, and language like um, immigrants are poisoning the blood of our country. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, these are not just like pseudo-Nazi ideas. These are Nazi ideas, right? And I think we've got to like say that clearly, really understand, um, and, and this, and you know, and when you call your political opponents sick and evil people, uh, right? This is also a kind of dehumanization of your political opponents. And this is this is um really death to the moral fabric or it rends the moral fabric of the country, the civic fabric of the country. And it's not something democracy can really withstand uh, that much of, right? Because democracy depends on us being able to sort of disagree, argue, uh, or try to out organize people we disagree with. And it, but at the end of the day, right, we have a vote, we have a, a, a legislative vote, we have an election. And if we're on the losing side of that, we accept those consequences, right? And we maybe try to live to reorganize another day. But at the end of the day, we don't say that Satan won, right? That's not how we think in a democracy, right? Um, and because that one that presumes the arrogant thing that God is certainly only on our side of whatever it is, but it also then dehumanizes. And we're seeing a lot more of that language as well, right? That 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 um, uh, political opponents are are even uh, like literally under the influence of demonic of the demonic. Uh, right. And it's just extremely dangerous language that, of course, leads to violence, because, uh, you know, if if uh, your opponent is a is a instrument of Satan, then almost everything's on the table uh, in yeah. terms of, of uh, resisting that. Yeah, it's a holy war, basically. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's a, it's a holy war. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And you both have touched on this, but but, you know, why is it that what is the obstacle? Some of us see this very clearly this situation that we are in right now and we connect the dots but many people don't what is the obstacle that is standing in the way of a more widespread understanding of this critical moment that we are in this fork in the road why is it that more people aren't here with us today uh, and along the way as we see these these um, signs of the um, the absolute danger that our country is in right now. I'll take a stab at it. I think um, there are two things. One in the broader culture is we as Americans have this myth that this can't happen here. Yeah. We hear um, we hear Robbie talking about fascism and Nazi ideology, and it's all true. But as Americans, we've been raised to think that that can't happen here. Mm -hmm. And so when we hear people like Robbie or myself raising this, talking about what's really at stake here, we as Americans can't fathom that. That's why January 6th is something that we can't really, we don't even know how to call it. 
whether it was an insurrection, whether it's a rebellion, mm -hmm. because those were scenes that we're used to seeing somewhere else. We can't fathom that we could lose our democracy. Yeah. That's a possibility we can't even entertain. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's one reason why we can't take it seriously is because we've, we've been raised for most of my life with a contrary ideology that that happens over there. It doesn't happen here. It can't happen here. And so I think that's one reason why we don't take it seriously and we recognize the danger that we're in because we, we, believe, we can't imagine that we could actually, that when someone says that they're going to be a dictator on day one, we say, well, that can't possibly happen here. And in point of fact, democracies do die and are in peril. But I think that's one reason why we don't take it seriously. Specifically in the Catholic world, I think another reason is that um, because official Catholic discourse prioritizes only one particular issue, and that is abortion being the preeminent priority of that's been identified for us by the U.S. Catholic Conference of Bishops, we're blind then as Catholics to anything else that goes on mm. and not realizing that many of the people who might be supposedly with us on one particular issue are also anti-Black, anti-immigrant, anti-Semitic, Islamophobic, that a whole lot goes with that kind of stereotypical secular anti-abortion movement. But because we've, pre we've prioritized one particular element, we blind ourselves to everything that goes along with, with that package. Mm -hmm. And we're not sufficiently critical then and say, wait a minute, if we vote only on that one issue, we are buying into a whole lot of other things that really imperil the very possibility of living together in a, in a civic democracy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll just uh, go right behind that and say, if you look at how issues cluster together in public opinion, you begin to see this worldview that, that Brian's describing mm -hmm. uh, pretty well. And you could document it. This is not just kind of conjecture, but like you look at which issues hold together and particularly which issues hold together uh, with the glue of white Christian nationalism, right? Yeah. So we, we find, for example, about three in 10 Americans um, uh, can be classified as either Christian nationalism adherents or sympathizers. So three in 10 and one of those two categories. And when we look at the group that adheres to that, and, and by the way, this are, we're measuring this in a public opinion survey by asking people not whether they self-identify, but whether they believe things like U.S. law should be based on the Bible. The U.S. should declare itself a Christian nation. Christians should hold dominion over other people um, mm -hmm. in this country, right? Those kinds of questions are what we're really measuring here. But when we look at that, what, what those attitudes are correlated with, you begin to see these linkages. So the, holding um, Christian nationalist views, may, uh, that group is much more likely to be anti-Semitic. Uh, they're much more likely uh, to be anti-gay. They're much more likely to be anti-Black and deny the effects of systemic racism uh, in, the, in the country. Uh, yes, they're more likely to say abortion should be illegal um, uh, in the country. But these attitudes all hold together um, in, in a package. Um, they're um, also more likely to hold uh, on to patriarchal, uh, patriarchal gender roles, uh, where men should be over women in authority. Uh, like Those are all kind of part of this one worldview. Uh, and so I think that's also worth remembering that these things are interconnected to one another. And one of the things that kind of provides the foundation for that whole package of things is a very particular, um, really white supremacist Christian worldview that really connects all of those. That's the connective tissue uh, mm -hmm. uh, between those things. So it's, it's, it is both a political uh, issue, but also a faith um, issue. One other thing is since we've got a, a larger Catholic audience here, just to, you know, remind everyone, I, I think that, um, in the country, um, Catholics hold fairly moderate views on, on abortion, um, and in fact, look mostly like the rest of the country um, on the issue of abortion. That is to say, uh, that most Catholics say that abortion should be either legal or, or should be completely legal or mostly uh, uh, legal um, in the country today. So that's where most Catholics are. Um, and for you know, for my mind, I'd like to say, look, um, 
I want to take that kind of seriously, right? That, that, that these aren't Catholics uh, who don't care about their faith, right? They're Catholics who take their faith quite seriously. And yet that's where they land um, on this issue after, after reflection. Well, it's quite clear that there's a huge gulf between where regular ordinary Catholics are and where the Conference of Catholic Bishops is at this point. Right, so, I, think that, I, mean, I think just before we move on, I know we want to move on, but just to make the point that again, for Catholics who hold that position, they're not holding it against the conference, the Catholic Conference of Bishops. They're holding it with Pope Francis. I think yeah, we need to point, we need right. to under, we need to underscore that. Mm -hmm. For example, Pope Francis has said that yes, we need to be we need to defend the life in the womb, but equally mm -hmm. sacred yeah. are the lives of the poor and the vulnerable mm -hmm. and the immigrant. Mm -hmm. With Pope Francis, who said that we cannot turn a blind eye to racism or exclusion in any form and yet claim to be defending the dignity and the, the sacredness of human life, and the dignity of life in you know, all its forms. In other words, we don't want to say, like with, with Robbie pointing out the data here, and to say that that's a position that's over against the USCCB and therefore not Catholic. No, Catholics are reaching these positions in union with with you know with others around the world with the catholic faith and said wait a minute here that we can't hold one group as being so preeminently worthy of life that we are therefore blind to the other threats to life that also exist yeah. i think that's what catholics are saying in the by in the numbers that robbie is in referencing that is because of our Catholic faith that many are many espouse the beliefs that Robbie has, you know, put out there for us. Mm -hmm. Such an important point, uh, Brian. Thank you for bringing that up. And we do have to move on to our next question. But before we do that, I just want to remind our audience that you can still submit questions by texting 202-601-7871 or by email at info at networklobby.org. Well, so we've talked about where we are right now in the country and in, in our Christian church. Um, where do we go from here? As a society, especially as Christians and Americans and people of goodwill, what steps do we need to take? What concrete steps do we need to take to move forward toward becoming that beloved community that Dr. King spoke about and that Jesus preached in the good news? where everyone is equal, where everyone has everything they need, where uh, they have equal access to the freedoms that only democracy can provide, and that everyone can live and thrive, no exceptions. How do we get there? Either one of you first. <laughs> okay, I'll go, Robbie, and see what... Uh... What happens here? Since this is one, a simple I'm, question, yeah, you can take it. It's such a simple question. <laughs> one, I'm glad you framed it in terms of the beloved community, because I do think that sometimes we can become so passionate about what we're against and the dangers we face that we're not also equally passionate about what vision do we have. Yes. And I think we spent the first part of our conversation talking about one fork of the road that we're going, that we have. What happens if we go down that fork? Now, what happens if we go down this other fork? We go down what Jesus would call the path of life, mm -hmm. what, what Dr. King called the beloved community. That how do we build that community of equals built upon the fundamental Judeo-Christian belief that all are created with equal sacred dignity and worth is being created in the image and likeness of God, without exceptions, full stop. All are equally sacred and equally in God's image. I think how do we get there? One, I think we get there by honesty and admitting that that's not where we're at now. Mm -hmm. And that church and the churches, as Robbie um, said earlier, have been very complicit in the process of our not being a beloved community, that that's not what we've been, and that's not the message we've always put out there. And I think it begins with a real examination of conscience, as we'd say in the Catholic tradition. We have to have a real examination of conscience, what in Protestant traditions say, as a come to Jesus moment. We have yeah. to really 
face some difficult truths about this. Mm -hmm. But it's only that truth will make us free. It's only that truth that can set us free then to go in another direction. And then how do we become a beloved community? After that real honest reckoning, we then have to have genuine contrition. We have to genuinely repent. And I think part of what hinders us from becoming a beloved community is that Christians, white Christians in particular, but all Christians are not, have not really been sorry or contrite, remorseful, lament the pain and division and the, and the brokenness of where we're at. So first we have to really have this examination of conscience, not only as individuals, but as church communities and own our participation and what God is in this brokenness. And then we need to lament and mourn and grieve where we are so that we can be then set free to go in a different direction and then to begin to repair the damage. But you first have to admit that there is damage and then really repent of the damage before you can then do the difficult work of repairing that damage that, that is, has led us to be in this broken place that we're at. Yeah. Well, I, what I love about, you know, what you said there, uh, Brian, is, um, you know, I mean, those are uh, Christian theological resources, right? You just talked about a whole well-known set of tools and practices that we have, right, as Christians, like built into the faith to help us here. And we just haven't really been willing to walk that road. And I'll, I'll say like we, particularly those who look like me, have not been willing to walk that road. I, I feel like one of the biggest problems in the way of white Christians in the country is this idea that we are good people who do good things. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way we allow ourselves to see ourselves. And I think one of the, the hardest things, you know, it's been hard for me um, um, as I've kind of delved into my own family's history, um, you know, in the Deep South and our complicity uh, in enslavement and all kinds of other things and, and displacing, killing indigenous people. Like that's all my family history. Right. But knowing that, learning that and like sitting with it and realizing like, OK, like that's something I really have to face, something I really have to understand both as an individual for my family, but as like part of, you know, a predominantly white institution uh, that has used that racial identity, right, for power uh, in the world and realizing that, that has had dire consequences, right, that, that we are, so even if we didn't do those deeds, like we're responsible for the, the consequences of those things in the present, right, and particularly those of us who have benefited uh, uh, from those things um, in, in the past. But I think that sense of like sitting with it and, you know, re contrition, repentance, um, you know, being willing to walk in a new direction. These are all like resources we have in this sense of I can definitely say this. You know, when you hear all the criticism about, you know, so-called critical race theory and all that, it's all about like, oh, it's just going to make people feel ashamed. Right. But that's never been what facing sin is about in the Christian tradition. Right. It's not about being ashamed. I mean, you might that, that might be a stage you go through. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's not the end of the story. The end is exactly what you said. It's liberation, right? That's how we, we become free of that baggage and bondage. And, and so one thing I'll say, Joan, to, that I'm actually hopeful about is that today we can have this conversation with 1,700 registered people to talk about white supremacy. Yeah. Like that's something like 10 years ago would have been hard to imagine, right? That we're going to like talk about white supremacy. Um, and I've been probably in a 150 uh, or more churches in the past two or three years who have wanted to talk about white supremacy in their own congregations. And I think that the kind of local work is like where it is so important uh, to do. What can we do in our own communities? Um, and one thing I'll name here just before I don't want to make sure I don't forget it. Um, as we, we, we mentioned um, the elections and poll workers. Like we are going to desperately need poll workers with integrity in this upcoming yeah. election. Like that's one volunteer thing where people, and we're losing them and, and we have been losing them because they've been threatened. Mm -hmm. uh, people are dropping out. Um, and so I think that's one place we can step up uh, and, and do that um, and, um, and, and begin to tell the truth in our local communities and look for play, ways like that where we can be of service, I think, and help, you know, help move things forward 
towards something that looks like everybody having a voice, nobody being intimidated, everybody's voice being heard. Well, yeah, I just want to uh, back up on that because um, I'm going to be giving a talk to the leadership conference of women religious um, later this August. And one of the challenges I'm going to put out there and I have let great minds think alike is to encourage women religious to be poll workers. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, to, and, to, and, and to do oh. it wearing religious garb. Yeah. And, it, and because I think it offers a concrete witness, but also because we know that voter intimidation is going to happen, I think people will be less willing to have that visual of attacking women religious and religious garb and to, and to make manifest the real dangers that are present, but also for women religious to be on the forefront. And not just women religious, men religious too, but we all know that women religious tend to be far more prophetic about this than the men religious are. And I'll say that publicly, that that's exactly what's going on. And yes, I'm trying to call out and shame my fellow men, you know, religious. I'm not a religious, I'm a Dyson priest, but hey, we're, I do think that that's exactly what's needed at this point. We need prophetic witness where King called for women, religious, and Catholics to show up. And we have those iconic pictures of the women religious marching with King at Selma. We are now at another Selma moment. And we need people, we need poll workers to be present where to witness for inclusive democracy, but not just as a American thing to do, but as a religious thing to do. Yeah. Because we're talking about the beloved community. One of the challenges I think that faces us is how do we know? Well, what does it mean to love a group that I've been trained to fear and despise? That's the asset test of moving toward the beloved community. What does it mean for me to love the immigrant? when the immigrant doesn't look like me or speak my language is incarcerating that immigrant or putting them in a situation where they lack adequate food or shelter. Is that genuinely loving? Is that the asset? Is that, is that what it means? Is that what it means to follow Jesus? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to, to love a group that I've been trained to despise and fear, whether it's black men, or whether it's poor people who are being, you know, undereducated in our nation's school system or underserved by our nation's healthcare system. This is what it means to be a beloved community. And it also means then being willing to challenge the ways in which we've been trained to fear and despise the other. And to realize that that fear, that disdain for the other cannot be squared with the message of Jesus Christ. Jesus died and then the season of resurrection rose for all of us. And I think that that's the message of resurrection here is that resurrection and conversion are religious language are saying that reality is not a closed system, that there is new life and there is new possibilities, but it means that we as Christians have to have the courage to love. And means the courage to love the immigrant, the courage to love the stranger, the courage to love black people, just put it bluntly out there, the okay. courage to love trans people and LGBTQ people. And there's nothing anti-Christian about loving LGBTQ people. I think that's what Pope Francis is showing us over and over and over again. And that this love needs to be translated then in political language and political policies but that's how we create this beloved community that begins with answering that answering that question. What does it mean to love those that I've been trained to fear and despise and disdain? That's how we begin to build this beloved community. Yeah. Yeah. And I do think that, you know, as the two of you have done, just helping people to see that the beloved community is not just beloved for black people or minoritized communities or marginalized communities, that there is an actual stake that white Christians have in moving us towards this beloved community and, and uh, where everyone will benefit. And I think those are the, 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 the points that we really need to bring uh, to the forefront with, 
with uh, people. And then maybe there'll be a, more of an openness towards, well, before we get there, there are things that we have to come to terms with, that we have to deal with, and behavior that we have to change, attitudes that we have to change, and willingness to start to take those steps forward. So um, I think what the two of you have brought to us today and, and in previous conversations is so important. Uh, and we need to, and I encourage you, and I know you're doing this, but continue to have these conversations in different venues and with different groups of people so that the message gets spread. It is like spreading the gospel. <laughs> so. All right. Well, that was a, a stimulating conversation. And we have a couple of questions uh, from the audience. Um, and one question, someone wants to know, can you speak to the background role of big money in these conversations? How is that? How is this uh, infusion of big money, or even the existence of you know the the capitalist system to allow people to achieve all of the, this wealth and, and influence? How has that contributed to where we are today? I could jump in there. You know, I'll recommend um, a, a, a book by Catherine Stewart called "The Power Worshippers," which really <laughs> delves into um, you know some of these. The way the money you kind of it's a follow the money book um and, and how this 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 happens and you know i will definitely say that by every measure i've seen um the the voices and the resources being put toward um this white christian nationalist vision far outweigh the resources being put toward the beloved community yeah. uh vision so we are certainly on an uphill battle or facing a headwind whatever metaphor you want to use um i the, the, the thing that gives me, I think, is, heartens me, though, is that um, it is not the fact that we are, I think often we, we the country is definitely divided, but it is not divided 50-50. Uh, I think this is really important to remember that, in fact, what we're seeing, I think, is in many ways the backlash of the beloved community making some progress during the Black Lives Matter movement. Like we are really seeing the backlash from electing our first African-American president. All right. So we're seeing these kind of pushbacks, but that means there's been progress. There's been movement here and there's a kind of counter movement um, uh, on, on the other side of it. And even with white Christian nationalism, as powerful as that has become in the country, and it does have way more resources than things being put toward building the beloved community. Um, again, it's, it's three in 10 Americans who support Christian nationalism. That means that two out of three Americans do not. Right. So what we're seeing in many ways is with the demographic change in the country, um, there's enormous amounts of money being spent to hold on to this older white Christian nationalist vision of the country as the country is changing. And that's why it, it feels so apocalyptic and the language is so apocalyptic on that side of it. And why I think there's so much money being poured in, because it, it, in, is, it, it is in a way a kind of death rattle or a last gasp effort to hold on to that vision of America that they see as slipping uh, away. Um, so I, there's some way in which we are in this kind of battle um, that uh, it, it feels like a headwind, but I think in fact that wind is, is in response to progress. And so I think, you know, now is the time to kind of push through. Um, and in, in many ways, I, I've thought about this a lot that, you know, we have never in our history fully been willing to close the door to that, kind of, yeah, a blasphemous vision of America as a promised land for European Christians. That's why it's still with us today. We have never said a full-throated no to that vision of the country. And I think that's what, you know, what the what the stakes are uh, today, as we've said. But I, I, I think that, uh, you know, money by itself is not going to do it, but I think it's being poured in at enormous levels because there is a kind of last stand uh, effort uh, is, is the way it, it, it seems in the midst of these other changes. Yeah. I agree with that, that definitely the movements that are fueling or trying to support white Christian nationalism are far more better funded than movements that are trying to advance the beloved community. Um, and I think that speaks to the confluence of political interest and big money interest have a, have a great deal at stake and trying to pre preserve the status quo or what they see as the status quo is being endangered. I want to take it another step and also say that 
The background role of big money can also play a role in silencing religious leaders mm -hmm. because many religious leaders don't want to speak out against white Christian nationalism or for the beloved community if that's seen as alienating potential big donors. Mm -hmm. We always hear priests saying and, and ministers saying that I can't, I would like to preach on these issues, but if I do, I'm going to lose parishioners. I'm going to lose financial support. I'm going to lose the dollars that I need to keep the building going, to keep the institution going. Um, so as we're aware of the role of money in our politics, and it is indeed a real issue and concern, we also need to be aware of how that also silences um, religious leaders and makes religious leaders complicit in not naming the gravity of the fork in the road that we're at because of their fear of alienating um, money that they need or perceive that they need in order to keep their institutions afloat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Brian, I just real quickly, you know, you know, the last time I think we saw this sort of thing in mass is during the civil rights movement, right? When many yeah. priests, pastors didn't lead, indeed lose their pulpits because they yeah. were willing to set, stand up and, and preach on it. And, you know, I, again, I think with the stakes as high, um, I'm hopeful we'll see some people willing to take that courageous stand and, and do it. Um, you know, and it, and it may, it may mean they have to do it at great cost to themselves. Uh, but you know, if we keep a building running, uh, you know, and that's the cost of it, uh, I can't say it's, it's been worth it. Yeah. Right. And I, I think the word you just used is courageous. And I think that's a word we haven't used often enough. And that is, we are never going to build the beloved community. We're never going to meet the challenge of this moment without an infusion of courage. Mm -hmm. And at least in the Catholic worldview, we look upon courage as being a gift of the Holy Spirit. And we really do need this moment calls for courageous witness. Mm -hmm. It calls for courageous action. It calls for taking a risk. And there has never been an advance of civil liberty or social justice without risk, without the need for courage. And I do think that we really need to pray for and work for and support people who are willing to take courageous steps and courageous witness, because this is not, the beloved community will not be built without some sacrifice. Yeah. It just can't be done. And I think that as we're celebrating resurrection during this Easter tide. We also need to remember that Good Friday was a, is also a part of the Easter story. Mm -hmm. It's not the end of the Easter story, but you wouldn't have the Easter story without mm -hmm. Good Friday. And that every advance of the gospel mm -hmm. is going to have some kind of price and the need for courage. Yeah, yeah and I do also think that um, the two of you have talked about a concept in, in Catholic social teaching called solidarity, how we come together as a, a community. And particularly because we are all Christians, we have that core of belief um, as you know a unifying um, principle that we can draw upon and together walk this, this path towards the beloved community, this path towards a greater solidarity. And, the, and uh, we have a question about solidarity. How can we encourage a more authentic solidarity that particularly uplifts the voices of those who have been pushed to the margins? Well, one, I think it, it begins with a, cho uh, a choice to listen to those voices, to listen to those voices. And I'll offer two things, two examples. Um, I've been so impressed with um, with Ravi, your your commitment to your your journey of of realizing the kind of blinders that you were raised with, but how being an intentional dialogue with African American Christians has been such an important part of your own journey. Um, that, so you've listened and so you deliberately listened to that voice. Um, I'm just coming back from the Philippines. I was there giving lectures sponsored by the uh, Jesuit University in, in Manila. 
And I was part of the National Synodal Process uh, sponsored by the Filipino Bishops Conference. And I was so impressed being a part of the LGBTQ group and how that group made a decision to privilege the voices of gay, lesbian, and trans Catholics and realize that we have to listen to that voice before we can even know where we need to move and how we need to change as a church. So part of being in authentic solidarity is to deliberately choose to make the choice to listen to the voice that has been suppressed and ignored and disdained. That's how we lift, that's how we that's how we build authentic solidarity but by making the choice to listen to that voice. I think yeah. it's as simple yeah. as that, but as radical as that. Yeah. Well, I'll just add one quick thing, Brian. I, well, thank you for the kind words. Um, but you know, it, it's here's the thing. I think most white people think of solidarity as a gift of altruism from us to them. Mm. You know, and I think that's at the heart of it the problem for, for us, I think, for people who look like me, right, is that because it still has a hierarchy to it, right? So here are the people who are oppressed or experiencing injustice. Here we are. So we're going to kind of like come down here and like give the gift of ourselves to this thing and call it solidarity, right? Mm -hmm. And and I, I think nothing could be further from the truth of the way that I've experienced anything like this. I mean, if, if you know, what I can honestly say is that um, now I was in church five days a week as a Baptist in the South. And like, I, you know, there wasn't a day that went by that I didn't hear the word Jesus or read the word Jesus. Um, I can honestly tell you, I did not understand Jesus until I began to read and be in conversation with African-American Christians. Like that's just the truth. Um, and so I think when you realize how co-opted Jesus has become in most of the white church, um, something like solidarity is sort of like, you know, uh, I think really if we realize the kind of state we're in because of the way we've let white supremacy creep into white Christian theology, we're in desperate need of a kind of reworking, uh, you know, dare I even say like salvation from that worldview, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and that's that means like we've got more at stake. I wrote that in White Too Long. We have more at stake. Um, uh, in, in, in being in solidarity um, with black and brown you know, people around the world and LGBTQ Christians and all of that um, uh, than they do, uh, right? And, and it's because we're the ones with the distorted theology, right? Mm -hmm. And so we really want to understand Jesus. We really want to understand God. Um, that's, I think that's what's opened it up. I can just say for me, that is what has opened it up uh, for me and realizing that, oh, like the work for justice because I, many of us, like in privileged positions, we feel like, well, you know, it's optional. I can just live my life, and there's not a lot at stake uh, here. And then there's some ways in which that's true because we're at this kind of top end of the power pyramid. Um, but that doesn't really take into account the state of our souls, <laughs> really, yeah. at the end of the day, right? Um, that's just kind of like, you know, our physical lived existence. But if, as Christians, we're going to think about the state of our souls, right? Mm -hmm. and, and what's our moral and and religious responsibility in the world and i think that's where solidarity is is actually you know it's a gift to white christians to be able to be in those conversations and in those interactions um and again i think you know we've got more at stake in making that happen uh, than than we're often really willing to to realize yeah yeah and i think that listening is so important as you've both named uh and and Brian, that is what the, the, the synodal process that we are engaging in in the Catholic Church worldwide is all about. And so it's kind of dis distressing to hear uh, that, um, you know, some, certainly here in the United States, that, that some parishes and some dioceses are not necessarily giving as much um, importance to the listening process of the synod uh, as I think Pope Francis would certainly have wanted us to do. But I also think, you know, Robbie, in terms of uh, Protestant Christians, um, that the opportunity to hear you and people like yourself, uh, you know, to have these conversations, to listen, to uh, bring forth the, the, the voices of other people themselves, not just through you, um, is, is really so important. And if people walk away from this conversation with nothing else, 
maybe just the thought of how can we arrange opportunities to listen more to people who are not like us, people who are different from us in whatever way, so that we can understand, so that we can begin to build that, uh, those bridges of solidarity. Um, well, we, I think, have um, one more question. Uh, hmm. What can I do as an average person, given where we are today in our country and in our churches, given how we've named uh, some steps that we need to take in order to move towards the beloved community, what can I, as an average person, do? Well, Brian, I'll jump in first, give you the last word here. How about that? Um, okay, uh, go for it. The, you know, so I, I've, I've written some things before. I've, I think I've written a thing like 10 things Christians can do, you know, um, kind, of, kind of pieces, but they really come down to starting somewhere. Uh, mm -hmm. Right. And just just finding somewhere. And I think local is really important. Sometimes it feels like, oh, I need to start at the state or national level and be impactful in that way. But I, the more I am in local congregations, the more I realize that's where the real work needs to be done, because people are in community. They're in responsible relationships with one another uh, and they're connected to everyday life. Right. Uh, in a way that really makes a difference. And so just a couple of really practical things. I, I Brian mentioned, um, you know, looking for things like uh, you know, being a poll worker, right? Uh, that's a really concrete, fairly simple uh, thing, but it's going to take some courage because this may not be that pretty uh, this time yeah. uh, around, but but really important. Uh, I think other places, I've, I, I've said this, if, if every predominantly white congregation in the country uh, set out to tell a truer history of its own congregation, um, that would also make a difference. So mm -hmm. just asking this question, like, why is my, why is my church on the land that it's on? Why in this part of the city and not that part of the city? Why on this side of the tracks or on this side of the river and not that side of the river? Mm -hmm. Why in the suburbs and not in the, uh, in the inner city, right? Do we used to be in the inner city and now we're in the suburbs? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Right. You know, those kinds of questions, you know, that can set a whole congregation on its own journey right, of truth telling and repentance and, and something that's very concrete and very connected, um, you know, were we a part of a restricted uh, covenant uh, in the neighborhood, right, that kept African Americans from living in the neighborhood. Um, many churches were, were anchor points, were hosting meetings for these redlining and restricted deed uh, meetings. Uh, they served as little hubs uh, for that. So I think telling that uh, story, I think, is one very concrete way uh, to make it, or, or doing your own genealogy. I mean, that uh, that's been a big part of my journey is like uh, really getting a, a really clear eyed view of like uh, where my family came from and what it meant uh, and what it meant for my family, what it meant for families who didn't look like mine, who didn't get the kind of things that we got along that, along that path. So I think we often think way up here, but I think some very concrete things uh, because once you start down that path, the rest of the path, I think starts to open up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What can I do as an average person? Um, the first thing you can do is make a commitment to vote. <laughs> um, and not only a commitment to vote, but also to encourage other people to register to vote. I think I read somewhere that 63 million Americans who are eligible to vote have not registered to vote. And so I think part of it is not only to vote, but to encourage others to vote and to be a part of voter registration drives and poll workers. I think that's really, really important. Another, I think, is to read and be informed. Mm -hmm. um, it's amazing how many people are not informed. And you wanna say, well, where should I start? Um, a new book by Rachel Swarns um, is called The 272. Mm -hmm. It's about the families that were enslaved and sold to build the American Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something that we, as especially a Catholic audience, needs to understand is that there would be no Catholic Church in America with it without enslavement, without African enslavement. It's a terrible, painful history. But as an average person, what can we do? We can become better informed about this tragic history so that we can learn about the decisions that were made to put us on one path and that we have an opportunity to go in a different, a different direction. And the other, and I don't say this lightly, is 
to pray, but to be conscious of how you pray. And I'll tell a story here of a student. Um, we were talking about different images of Jesus. And the student told me that for their Lenten practice, they prayed to the black Christ, to picture Christ as an African-American man. Mm. And this white student, who happened to be white, happened to be male as well, talked about how at first when he did this, he felt kind of that this was something that was really cool to do, mm. you know, because he was doing something that was kind of cool. And then he said, but as Lent moved on for those 40 days, and he realized if Christ is a black man, do I really see Christ in other black people? Mm. How does that change the way I see people on the subway here in New York City? How does I change people who are homeless? Do I really see that person as Christ? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a real challenge for us is that what the average person can do is pray, but how do you pray? Are you praying to a predominantly white image God or Jesus? And how does that reinforce the kind of white supremacy we've been talking about? Or can I pray and image Christ in, in different ways, in different skin, and realize that that too is valuable and gifted by God. Mm -hmm. And to see the ways in which I resist that, or also the invitations it gives me to live differently or in a different way. Mm -hmm. And so vote definitely encourage others to, to vote and to register, um, read and be informed, but also to pray for justice, but also how do we pray and to to whom do we pray? Mm -hmm. I think all of that can really lead us further down this road to becoming a beloved community. Yeah. And maybe also, um, and this is this is our final question here. Um, you know, as people in the pews, as as people who are uh, in these church communities, how can we uh, encourage our pastors? How can we encourage our um, pastoral leaders to speak out about voting and registering to, to vote and getting people um, engaged in the political process without violating their 501c3 uh, tax status? How can we talk about these issues in a nonpartisan way? Do I go for that one, Robbie? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it, it's what I would love to see. Uh, and I think this is the thing that sort of broke my heart about uh, the kind of political antics during Holy Week with the Bible hawking and the comparison to Jesus. And um, is that there were no prominent uh, people speaking out uh, who are in the sort of like Republican uh uh, MAGA supporting camp, there were no prominent Christian leaders that I could find speaking out against that, yeah. right? Regardless of where they supported the Republican Party or the candidate. And I, I think that, you know, if we could have our, there's nothing in anyone's 501c3, you know, um, uh, standing that says you can't speak out against the dehumanization of other people, uh, mm -hmm. that you can't speak out about the literal demonization of political opponents, that you can't speak out against um, threats of political violence, uh, that you can't speak out against promises to thwart a free and fair democratic process. So I think there are some bright lines that actually our religious leaders and priests and clergy and, um, and pastors could draw um, that get nowhere near the sort of 501c3 concerns, mm -hmm. right? But are really about the kind of character and public life uh, that we want to that we want to protect and have, and I, I, was, I was thinking this other question about um, the fragility of all of this, right? It, mm. it, the, and Brian, what you said earlier about we think it can't happen here, but it reminded me of um, you know the famous line that that Ben Franklin gave after they created the Constitution. Somebody asked him, "Well, what kind of government do we have?" And he said, "A republic, sir, if you can keep it." Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I, I feel like the same thing could be said about like, what are we building here in terms of, um, uh, you know, Christianity? And it, it's something like, well, the beloved community, 
if we can keep it. Uh, right. And we have to be willing. We've got to build it and we've got to protect it. Um, and if we don't, um, we're not going to have either. Yeah. I think you're absolutely right, Robbie, in terms of people are always wanting to be saying we can't become partisan. But there is absolutely nothing partisan about saying that there is no room in our political discourse for dehumanization of other human beings. There is no room in our political discourse for threats of violence or or, or offering or violent retribution or talk of retribution mm -hmm. toward one's political enemies. Yes. That kind of discourse needs to be condemned no matter who offer, who, who offers it or who, who, who utters it. Mm -hmm. um, we need to condemn the kind of rhetoric that's used that calls the people vermin or poisoning yes. the fabric of our country. That is not Christian language. Okay. And I think we always have this fear of being partisan and it is used to silence us, mm -hmm. whereas we need to be say, wait a minute, there are certain things which are beyond the pale of responsible political discourse and responsible Christian discourse. Yeah. The other thing I think we need to understand is that there are people, even though one of the people who is responsible for this is running their a presumptive Republican nominee, there are people in the Republican Party who are opposed to this kind of rhetoric, who are yeah. opposed to this, and who stood up honestly and said, no, that is not what it means to be a responsible American, a responsible Christian. Yeah. And so I think that we need to understand that we can oppose that kind of rhetoric, oppose that, that kind of dehumanizing practice, frankly, mm -hmm. and, that, and, that, and that idolatrous practice and we need to call that out and realize that that's not being partisan. That is standing up with the best of what it means to be a Christian and the best of what it means to be an American. Amen. And that is a message that uh, we as individuals can carry among the groups that we are associated with in our families, in our communities, in our you know, social uh, arenas, as well as our pastors and and. Uh, uh, pastoral leaders and bishops uh, can speak out uh, in around those issues and around uh, uh, those uh, uh, beliefs that are fundamentally about our Christian values. Uh, well, we are at the end of our time together. Uh, once again, we have had so much to say, uh, and there's still so much that left that we could talk about. Um, I, I want to particularly thank you, Father Brian Massengale and Dr. Robert P. Jones, for another stimulating and this time uplifting conversation about our beloved community. We are so grateful for your presence with us today and always. Thank you both for your time, your wisdom, and your courage to speak truth to power. And now it is time for us to transition the program to our young adult panel. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Colin Martinez Longmore, communications and social media coordinator here at Network, who will moderate our young adult panel. Colin. Thank you, Joan. And hi all, very happy to be with you all um, this afternoon or early morning, depending where you are. Um, as we continue on, we're going to move over into our young adult panel, where we're going to hear from um, a group of young people and see how they are dealing with the big questions that we are asking today and how it affects their everyday life. Um, I'm very pleased and grateful to uh, be joined today by three distinct young adults who are uh, people of faith that are justice seekers and that are going to be sharing about their experience doing um, a lot of this work that we're talking about. Um, so with that, I'd like to invite up our panelists, uh, Kayla Jacobs, Adam Freeman, and Ben Dickinson. As a quick introduction for each of them, Kayla Jacobs is the Program Manager of Youth Mobilization at the Catholic Climate Covenant. Adam Friedman is the Engagement and Advocacy Associate at Interfaith Alliance. And Ben Dickinson is a student at Xavier University in Cincinnati, Ohio, class of 2026 and one of our Young Advocates Leadership Lab um, student leaders as well. 
Um, so with that, um, we have three questions that we're going to get to and hear a little bit from each of them. Everyone will get a chance to answer these. Um, and as we go to the questions, I'll just um, uh, direct the questions to, to each person as uh, we've introduced Kayla first, Adam, and then Ben. Um, and excited to, to hear um, about your insight and your experience in this. Um, so let's start with our first question, and this will go to Kayla first. Um, how do you connect your civic, civic engagement, your commitment to democracy, your political engagement? Um, how do you connect that to your faith? Uh, good morning, everybody. Good to be here with all of you. Um, yeah, so many people of faith that I know got involved in civic engagement through their faith. I actually got involved in faith through civil engage their civic engagement. Um, so there hasn't ever really been a time where there is like a separation between the two for me. I became a Catholic uh, in my early 20s, um, and I was largely due to uh, Catholic social teaching. I learned and saw and practice by uh, the Sisters of Mercy at St. Xavier University in Chicago, which is where I went to school. Um, I grew up in a mixed race home. Um, I have family members who, um, you know, are immigrants, and you know, our family have had has had some tough times around around that issue. And I also grew up in a home um, of many generations of active union members, and so I was kind of raised with the principles of Catholic social teaching, like the concepts, uh, but I didn't have the language for it in terms of faith until I met the Sisters of Mercy. Uh, and so that intrigued me and eventually I converted and that's a whole nother story. But um, so yeah, from the very beginning, my civic engagement and my faith were always intertwined. And then additionally, I spent most of my adult life um, living in intentional communities, uh, mostly the Catholic worker, um, in the Catholic worker community. And um, so mercy has really shaped my spirituality and uh, the example of Dorothy Day has been kind of my model of uh, how to be a Christian and practicing Catholic. And um, the biggest lesson I learned from her is just that we are all called to be prophets and uh, civic engagement is a way that Christians are called to be prophets in the world today. Uh, so yeah, I'm very grateful. I live in a democracy. I feel really blessed that I get to work every day to um, protect, you know, our democracy and also get others involved. And um, yeah, and I, I get a lot of support and energy from um, my Catholic faith in doing this kind of work. Well, hi, all. Thank you so much for, for having me this uh, morning or afternoon, depending on where you are in the country. I, uh, in thinking about my own upbringing, my own relationship with faith, I think back to uh, as, a, as a reformed Jew growing up in California, mitzvah days we would host. And uh, there, there was this experience of kind of living values of showing up and each person uh, when we hosted these events at our, our home congregation would just do what they could. Right? I remember being two years old at, at one of our mitzvah days um, and only being tall enough to wash hubcaps at our, our car wash where we were raising money for a nearby uh, community. And that's what I could do. So that's how I served. And as I grew up, I remember uh, hearing from other folks who participated in different tracks, showing up to remove invasive species, showing up to serve food uh, to folks who are unhoused, each person doing what they could with their talents and their time. And uh, as someone who does interfaith work, I'm very lucky to learn from the Catholics that I'm shoulder to shoulder with this concept of tithing as three big T's, right? Tithe, time, and talent, where each person is called to give in a different way based on their capacity and the way in which we show up builds into this larger fabric, this tapestry, of a movement for justice. And in my mind, that's at the heart of what democracy is in our country, right? When we think about civic engagement, when we think about a commitment to democracy, when we think about engaging in politics broadly, in my mind, all of these things for people of faith stem from this notion of showing up as we are called uh, to give in, in whichever way we can. And it's something that, at least for me, in my experience, comes directly from how I was raised and what it looked like to be a person of faith in practice. Well, howdy all. Um, as you can hear from that greeting, 
uh, that Southern greeting of howdy. Uh, I am from Kentucky, and um, and, and that's affected my background uh, and, and a var- in a variety of ways as a cradle Catholic and somebody who was born um, in in a place where um, that kindness and that warmness of you know greeting everybody, howdy, holding the door for each other is is very evident. But what I feel um, in a lot of ways at times was missing um, in that upbringing was the understanding of the privilege that um, communities that I grew up in had as um, as I, I've grown up in a, in a place where food, water, shelter, education, um, all those basic resources um, were something that was an afterthought and it was something that um, was was not worried about necessarily. Um, and so it was not until I went to Xavier University in Cincinnati that I realized um, the level of privilege that I really had. And that transitioned me um, into a point in my faith journey right now where I feel like um, the book of Esther and one particular verse, which I'd like to share right now, um, is a, a great descriptor of, of kind of what civic engagement in faith means to me. So. Um, Esther chapter 4, verse 14 reads, For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but you have come to a time, you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Now, depending on which version of um, the of scripture you're reading, that verse can be translated as perhaps you were born for a time such as this. Um, and that is something, and, and, and Adam, what you just mentioned with time, talent, and treasure, um, is exactly nail on the head um, as far as where I feel um, my best use of, of my time and my talent is at this point as somebody who comes from a background of privilege um, with resources and, and grew up in a, in a community of people who are faithful. Um, but now has uh, in Cincinnati and Xavier had the opportunity to, to be with those who are marginalized financially and on the basis of race um, and victims of homophobia, Islamophobia, xenophobia of, of all forms and to um, be able to learn from those people through horizontal service and, and uh, solidarity and just conversation and then translating that into um, conversations with family and being impactful um, family and friends and people who come from a background um, which just such a different lived experience um, and to encourage them to use their voice um, in a way that, that welcomes every member of the human family into beloved community. Excellent. Thank you all so much um, for that introduction uh, as to who you all are as justice seekers and, and people of faith. And um, I, I, every time we just get young people that are doing this kind of work together, it, it, I feel so energized and, and, and excited uh, because even though the challenges are real, hearing um, this, th- this perspective, this courage, and this hope um, that, 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 that you all shared so far um, is always inspiring. So I want to um, drill down a little bit more individually with each um, and look at where we are in this current moment. Um, as we heard earlier in the conversations, um, you know, it, it is a, a, a fraught time that there, there are there are big questions that we have to answer. There, there are big challenges that we must um, face. And uh, I'm curious to know how each of you all are participating in that work. Um, how are you engaging in the election this year? Tell us a little uh, about the work that you do. So we'll start off again with Kayla. Um, yeah, so my work in general is to develop leadership teams of high school students across the country and then train them throughout the school year, uh, essentially to be climate leaders uh, in their schools or parishes or communities. Uh, so throughout the school year, they all meet regularly and learn about various topics like net zero, advocacy, how to lead nonviolent campaigns, community organizing, etc. cetera. Uh, and then they also engage in legislative advocacy. And about 70% of the students involved in our program this year are seniors and they're about to graduate and they're also about to vote for their first time. Um, in a recent lobby day we had like a couple of weeks ago with our students in Chicago, um, one of the congressional offices were, that we were meeting with were like 
frankly pretty rude <laughs> to mm. and condescending towards the students. Um, they made like a couple comments like, well, you are so young, you probably don't really understand how Congress really works or like you can't vote yet. And um, yeah, it was very you know unsettling for them. And I was really proud when um, my students pointed out like, actually you're wrong we learn about this stuff through our program and then also most of us will be able to vote and are about to vote for the first time um and that just really put it into perspective of how underestimated um that age group is and why it's so important to develop their leadership and prepare them for um you know the election season um and then also why like catholic social teaching formation is just so important in our catholic schools and our parishes um and then this year i'm also working with several different uh, communities of sisters in the midwest organizing around the um, republican national convention and the democratic national convention the RNC is happening in Milwaukee, uh, where I live, in July, and the DNC is in Chicago in August. Um, and so for the RNC, we're planning like a kickoff press conference and public witness um, and a prayer vigil taking place at a convent in Milwaukee that um, is kind of on a busy road. So many people will see us there praying with our signs as well. Um, and then this will be followed with an around the clock prayer vigil throughout the whole convention. Um, by the sisters and associates. Um, and then sisters in Chicago are organizing similar events there uh, for the DNC. And my role that I am doing with the sisters is to uh, bring some of the youth and young adults that uh, we work with to uh, support these efforts and um, be engaged in these efforts. So um, as, as uh, it was mentioned previously, I am lucky to work at Interfaith Alliance, which is a 30-year-old nonprofit based here in Washington, DC. And uh, our organization is focused on protecting true religious freedom for, for all folks in the United States, uh, which is built around a, a strong First Amendment, as well as uh, protecting and furthering our democracy. And so uh, we're doing that in, in a number of ways as we approach the election year. And I'm very lucky to be in the position of working horizontally across the organization uh, in, in our field department, our policy department, uh, and through our programs to really make that notion of what it means to uh, create a, a pluralistic uh, multicultural democracy, what it means to make that a reality. And, and so, the way we've uh, kind of built this out as we approach the election is through three different buckets of work. We're looking at education, mobilization, and, and response. And uh, I think this is kind of a pipeline that we're thinking of broadly at the national level as we build programming, but it also mirrors uh, the way a lot of this work looks in communities, right? The first, the first step is often education. We have to recognize what's at stake you know, who is implicated in uh, not only the broader policy decisions that might arise depending on election outcomes, but uh, also who isn't at the table as we, we think about how to mobilize, right? And so our uh, education work tangibly as we approach the 2024 election uh, has looked a lot like ensuring our networks are ready, not only to respond to threats of, of political violence and increased polarization, which uh, the previous panel discussed, but also, uh, doing that that educational work to reground ourselves in this positive vision of what our country can be uh, when people from from different faiths and beliefs and people of no faith or, or no uh, no religious background all come together respect one another's different uh, faith traditions and further this cause of democracy which uh, we like to believe is is done uh, simply by by coming together in that way right we're, we're practicing democracy. Uh, we're also focusing on mobilization. So we hope that after folks engage with the educational resources and, and trainings that uh, we're providing around the country and virtually this election season, uh, folks find their calling. And what we're really building out now are uh, election protection opportunities. So we've partnered with Faiths United to Save Democracy to ensure that faith leaders uh, in our networks and folks who um, come from the ecumenical world and folks who, who represent um, other faiths have the opportunity to serve their community by showing up as uh, 
whole chaplains and actively uh, ensuring that there's you know, a peaceful uh, culture of civic engagement that's affirmed at the grassroots level. And then we've, we're also working with uh, Lawyers Committee and Common Cause to provide folks in our network with the opportunity to work the election protection hotline. Uh, so especially for folks who are thinking about how to serve on this call, uh, know that there are options outside of being on the ground. We know that it, it's a difficult election uh, and it can be anxiety inducing for many to think about what it looks like to, to be on the ground physically. And so we're providing those virtual opportunities. Um, and then the, the last kind of area we're building out as we think about this election season is responding, right? We've heard a lot about Christian nationalism today. And in general, we see it more and more in, in our public sphere. And so what we're trying to do at Interfaith Alliance is build out uh, language for our faith leaders and our folks on the ground so they not only can recognize how um, this political movement is, is cloaked in this very narrow uh, conception of faithful language and faithful framing, but how we can understand what, what folks are actually trying to do and, and how we can push back from a place of our own faith values, our own understanding of morality uh, built through formation and, and how we were raised in our own faith traditions. Um, and so in addition to developing that language, we're also hoping to actively call out um, these instances of Christian nationalism as we see them uh, around the country from, from politicians and, and folks that are unfortunately misappropriating the language of faith to further a political agenda. Well, I want to thank you for your incredible work, um, Kayla and, and Adam, first of all, before I hop into a few things that I currently um, do do a lot of um, incredible advocacy um, and have incredible opportunities to advocate and have my voice lifted by network um, and the Y'all Young Advocates Leadership Lab program. Uh, but I did want to just before I get into that kind of lay the groundwork for how my, my faith um, journey has led me to this point where I do have this incredible opportunity. Uh, and my faith and advocacy journey um, when coupled with each other. So um, upon coming to Xavier, the first club I got in that really introduced me to these ideas of uh, marginalization and systemic oppression um, was some of the opportunity I had to work with what a, a program we have on campus that is called Exchange. And that is a weekly service program that is based and rooted in horizontal service. So um, the the goal of doing service is not to be that that white savior um, that that person that does service once a week and then gets back in their uh, you know Mercedes or it goes home and and uh, it accumulates these um, the these kind of manifestations of privilege and it's it, um, something that we uh, we at Xavier experience a lot and a lot of people at Xavier are very, very fortunate to be um, at an institution such as Xavier. So going to Xavier and going to um, places such as, you know, food pantries downtown where we got to shop with neighbors um, who had this just impermeable joy despite their, um, despite their economic situation. Um, and, and then going into schools and uh, uh, children are affected by, um, you know, the the economic and financial marginalization of their parents not being uh, paid a, a living wage and, and not being able to be home to mentor them. Um, and so that kind of led me into some affordable housing advocacy with a wonderful group called Cincy Action for Housing Now. Cincinnati is one of the more gentrified cities in America, um, and it goes um, each year has the highest rent increase in the nation. Um, and so able being able to go onto the street in Cincinnati and, and see the not only um, disparity in the living conditions of people, but how that is affected and intersects with race in Cincinnati um, as a very segregated city in terms of housing. Um, that also is a manifestation of Cincinnati's um, criminal justice system and Ohio's criminal justice system at large. So right now I have the wonderful opportunity and blessing to work with an organization called Ignite Peace in Cincinnati, um, which is a nonviolent advocacy-based nonprofit, which focuses on calling people into conversations um, and, and just naming some of the inequity that we see in Cincinnati. Um, and right now we have some really exciting projects going on with working on 
abolishing the death penalty in Ohio, which is something that um, is becoming an ever, ever possible reality. And um, so are, are really excited um, to be able to have the opportunity to deliver some postcards from um, people and constituents and, and advocate for the human dignity of everybody and amplify the voice of people whose voice has been quieted by our systems. Now, um, that's led me to the incredible opportunity um, to advocate with y'all. And that program um, encourages students and peers that are young minds on campuses to, first of all, involve themselves and give themselves the opportunity to vote by registering simply. But um, more importantly, to become multi-issue voters and people who understand that um, issues regarding um, the freedom of humans to live healthy and prosperous and lives where they have the resources they need are um, all those issues uh, as far as housing, health care, um, freedom to practice religion are equally sacred. Um, and to look at those and, and, and to understand that um, candidates are able to um, reflect those in their policies and that there's not one candidate that knows all um, in terms of those. So to encourage people to look at candidates for a more holistic view and, um, and to encourage people just simply to register to vote and, and engage themselves in the conversation and be responsible voters by doing the necessary research to understand um, how a candidate views some of these some of these things that welcome everybody into the human family. Excellent. Um, thank you all so much. And, and honestly, big shout out to, to each of you um, for, for, for showing up and being that, that presence um, in, in, in the work that you do um, in each of your spaces. Um, what I love in hearing what each of you share is how intersectional a lot of the work it is that you're doing, how intergenerational a lot of the work is. Um, and I think that that is the way that we reach that pluralistic, multicultural, multi-faith society. Um, it can only happen through the work that is being done that we're hearing here and, and, and that's happening across the country. So, so thank you all um, again so much for, for that continued work. Um, as we wrap it up with our final question, uh, it's a simple one, but uh, one that I think we, we all really need, and it's about hope. Um, where do we find hope in the work that we continue to do and, and, and as we look ahead, especially during an election year? Uh, I'll pass it to Kayla. Yeah, so honestly, about a year ago when I started really seeing like ramped up campaigning for this election, I was kind of like stopped in my tracks and I like turned to a friend. I was like, I am not ready for this again. Like, <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, and sadly, like the election seasons have become like a traumatic experience for many people, myself included. Um, and it's taxing, it's just like hard. But um, but that being said, I'm continuously impressed by um, my students. And as I mentioned, many of them are about to vote for the first time. Um, they're all just such like well-rounded individuals and passionate about the poor, vulnerable in the earth. And so I know that those are issues they'll be thinking about and advocating for. So that gives me hope. And then I'm also just encouraged by uh, their consistent willingness to put pressure on decision makers. So no matter who wins an election, whether Kayla, can you uh, re repeat that last sentence? I think there was a bit of a glitch. Okay, yeah. Um, I was, yeah, so I was, I was just saying how I'm encouraged by my students' willingness to continuously put pressure on decision makers. So whether that's like whoever wins the election, whether it's an election year or not, they're just always ready and willing to advocate for uh, what is right and what their faith inspires them to do. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I, I first off want to say that um, Kayla and Ben, you you give me hope uh, to everyone on this call. You give me hope. And um, just broadly, everyone I've met going around the country uh, so far this year, as we do election activations in different places, everyone I, I've met gives me hope. And um, I, I just quickly want to mention, I feel like there's this very fine line between the language of, of hope and the language of faith. And to 
to really internalize that is to recognize that there is something inherent about hope to being a human being, right? Hope is mm. is what compels us to get out of bed in the morning. It's what compels us to try and be better a little or a little bit better each day. And when we apply that to the election, in my mind, hope is not just uh, the the hope of getting through this election season, the the hope of hopefully achieving certain policy goals or, or something like that. In my mind, the hope that really is is bringing me through this moment and um, the, the hope that I've seen on the ground that is bringing people through this moment is understanding this moment as part of a much larger movement and recognizing that this election is just one uh, point in a much la larger story of, of democracy in our country. And ultimately through the very act of maintaining hope, of preserving and nurturing hope, and even of nurturing faith itself, uh, across lines of difference in community with people who look like us, people who don't, uh, we are practicing democracy actively. We are actively leaning into hope and we are uh, synthesizing the way our faiths come together and, and create this uh, kind of microcosm of democracy. In, in doing all of these things, we are, we are embodying the multiracial democracy that is an inevitability for our country. So I think so much of the the fear and uh, the pain and and the traumatic experience of um, this this election season for so many people that that Kayla mentioned, uh, what that is to me is is really the repercussions of lashback because people uh, who who disagree with us, people who perpetuate Christian nationalism, understand that this multiracial pluralistic democracy is an inevitability for our country, and they're fighting tooth and nail to try and stop it. And so what gives me hope is knowing that we are winning, the, the cause of pluralism, the cause of hope is winning. Um, and it is our job to see this not as a moment, but again, as, as a movement that we are all a part of. Amen. Absolutely. Uh, I'm very, very encouraged and hopeful to be part of a panel such as this, uh, like, like, uh, you all have mentioned it's it's just such a joy to be in a group of people who uh, have the same passion and such an evident and tangible passion. I, I think one of the things that you know, I recently learned that is just incredibly encouraging is that this election in 2024 at a federal level is going to be the first one where millennial and Gen Z voters make up the majority of voters um, are projected to. And I think that as far as the Catholic church and the Catholic community that I'm in, uh, people have a deep desire, not necessarily to be connected to a particular party or politician, but to be connected to being agents of positive change. And this sounds a little unorthodox, but when you look at for example, a theory of change kind of says that the goal of advocacy is to strengthen your supporters, move the people who are indifferent or neutral more into support, and to um, kind of isolate the opposition. So the opposition, as Adam mentioned, is getting louder and louder as people realize that um, pluralism and, and um, a, a church and a society where everybody is welcome into this human family is absolutely something that we are moving in the direction of. But also I think a lot of people that may say that their lives aren't affected by politics also have these open minds to hearing about how policy affects the issues that they're passionate about and are passionate about um, making sure that we protect the earth, our common home, but make sure that we welcome everybody to the table of plenty um, as, as our Father Damien Torres Bateo, who is our um, parochial vicar at Bellarmine Chapel on, on the campus of Xavier, always says that, that there's a table of plenty and there's room for everybody's voice at this table. And I think that is a value of this generation that's gonna be reflected in voting. Um, and that this panel today has certainly encouraged me as far as that is going to be something that um, helps us make sure that as, as Christians, we are moving towards beloved community. Amen, amen. Kayla, Adam, Ben, thank you so much for uh, your, your your presence here today, for sharing your insight and your witness. Um, 
and yeah, the 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 challenges we face are daunting, but knowing that um, there is this swell of you know uh, the, the, this next generation of of faithful leaders um, is something that continues to bring hope for all of us. So thank you all um, for that. All right, friends. So we've heard how um, how how young people are responding in this moment, and um, we want to pivot now to to you all that are watching and seeing what it is that you all can do next um, in this important moment. So with that, I'm going to invite up uh, my colleague, Meg, and uh, we'll pass out to her. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Wow. What an incredible time we've had together this afternoon. Of course, um, from Brian, from Father Massengill and Robert Jones, we heard so clearly how as people of faith, whether we're faith leaders or the average person, how we can move beyond white Christian nationalism in the U.S. and promote a vibrant, multi-faith, multi-racial democracy where every person can thrive, no exceptions. I hope you were as inspired by Kayla, Adam, and Ben as I was. And now that you are excited to join Network in our 2024 election campaign, vote our future. Everyone thrives, no exceptions. To ensure that you are equipped to participate in this campaign, my marvelous colleagues in the grassroots mobilization team and I have developed a four-part training series informed, engaged, and committed. In this series, participants will dig deeper into what it means to be a Catholic multi-issue voter, which you've heard so many people talking about today. Learn strategies to engage your, your friends and family and neighbors in challenging conversations and build hope-filled narratives that inspire people to care more, to care about important issues. And finally, to explore concrete actions you can take to be effective this election season, including how to become a poll chaplain with Network's partner, Faiths United to Save Democracy. Since there are already over 500 people registered for this series, which starts on Tuesday, April 9th, I am excited to announce that we will have an entire second round of training starting on Tuesday, May 7th. If you're already registered for round one, stay put. And our hope is that you will invite at least five of your friends to participate in round two. So early next week, all of you, everyone who is registered for this event today will receive a follow-up email with a recording of this event, network's equally sacred checklist, and the link for informed, engaged, committed network's 2024 election series. So here's what I and the rest of my colleagues here at Network are asking you to do. One, share this recording with your friends and family along with the discussion guide that is linked right next to the recording. Read our equally sacred checklist and then share it with your friends and family. This equally sacred checklist, which outlines six freedoms, is the primary election resource that supports Catholics to be multi-issue voters. And we have it available in Spanish as well. And then finally, register for our election training series. While we would love to have you join us for all four workshops, we will welcome your participation and presence at any of them. And again, if you're all signed up for round one of the series and are excited to kick off with us early next week, please invite at least five of your friends to register for round two. So as Pope Francis says, the only future worth building includes everyone. And if we are going to live into this fully inclusive future beloved community, we must show up as our whole selves and do our part this election season and beyond. So I hope you're ready to join us. Well, thank you, Meg. Um, well, friends, we have come to the end of another deeply meaningful, relevant, and timely conversation. Our profound thanks to Dr. Robert P. Jones and Father Brian Massengale for once again helping us to acknowledge where we are in this most consequential time for our country and our Christian church. For reminding us of our civic responsibility as people of faith, 
and for leaving us with a modicum of hope, more than a modicum of hope, for a future that is within our grasp. Thank you also to Colin Martinez Longmore and our young adult panel who have shown us that young adults do care. They are paying attention, they are involved, and they will participate actively in moving our society toward the vision of a beloved community. Now is the time for us as Christians and Americans to reclaim the narrative, to stand up to the forces that would act only for their own good rather than for the common good, and to declare not on our watch. We are Easter people. We believe in new life and we can make the beloved community a reality. But it all starts with using our political power to put people in office who will actually work for the common good, who will create a democracy that is pluralistic, equitable, and welcoming of all, who will protect the freedoms that are only available to us in a fully functioning democracy. That future is in our hands. Thank you all again for being with us this afternoon. Be sure to share what you have learned with others and sign up to participate in our elections programming from now until November. And please go to our website at www.networklobby.org for more information on this and other ways to be involved. Share it widely. Enjoy this Easter season and thank you again for joining us. Be well. <laughs>